So we live in a, in a world that is filled with all kinds of anxieties. And every day, our news feed tells us just how bad things really are. You know, whether it's inflation, our, our children's education, immigration, health care, climate change, inequality, geopolitics, moral decline. It's exhausting, isn't it? <laughs> Everything that we can be so worried about. In fact, because of this, anxiety now has become the number one health concern, mental health concern that people face. An estimated 275 million people suffer from anxiety disorders. I mean, even the TV series, which are supposed to be times that we relax, are filled with the anxiety of our world. In Netflix's series, new series, Beef, the first episode opens with a case of road rage as Danny seeks revenge after Amy nearly crashed her pearly white SUV into his uh, worn pickup truck. And then, then the pair after this go to extreme links, bad Yelp reviews, flirting with siblings, even guns to get payback. Fueling all of this is an underlying anxiety. Danny is stressed about his brothers and parents who lost all of their money in a, that they used to have in a, in a motel investment because they invested in his cousin's illegal goods. And Mary is, uh, Jane, uh, sorry, and Amy is stressed by her, by her husband, George, her mother-in-law and her daughter. And so in such an anxiety-filled world that we find ourselves in, you know, we can easily get caught up in it. Christians today are just as anxious as everyone else is. And so how do we thrive in this world and not get caught up in it all? Today we begin a new sermon series called Sojourners in a, in a World of Anxiety. So the early church faced all kinds of pressures from the world as well. And in 1 Peter, we find sound advice for living in a world like ours. So I just want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. And this is the first 12 verses that we're going to be looking at. So it's 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're looking at verses 1 through 12. And here in this short passage, we find one of Paul, Peter's strategies to thrive, and it is to rejoice. Rejoice. So rejoice means to celebrate or extol the help and acts of God. Uh, rejoicing is not a mood of satisfied joy but a conscious expression of joy. So it's not something that we feel because of our circumstances, but it's a choice to be jubilant and, and thankful because of the things that God has done in our lives. And so rejoicing is something that we do here on Sundays. It's a choice that we make, and either we can choose to be you know, gloomy or we can choose to rejoice. And so rejoicing is a choice that we make. Now, to rejoice, as Peter will prescribe, requires two conditions. First, reassessing our relationship with the world. And second, grasping the full benefits of what we have in Christ. Now, Martin Luther described 1 Peter as the, one of the noblest books in all of the New Testament. He said it's a, it's a paragon of excellence on par even with Romans and with the Gospel of John. And unfortunately, it has often been ignored in the modern church. Now, Peter begins his book in verse 1 with these words. To those who are elect exiles. Now, he calls his readers exiles or, or sojourners three times in this book. In the first century, Exiles was a term to designate those who didn't hold citizenship in the place where they resided, and therefore they were viewed generally as foreigners. Now, while some of those people that, that Peter is writing to may have been exiles de deported from Rome, Peter's use of the word here should be understood more as defining the relationship between Christians and the world that they live around. 
And so Christians are just passing through this world as foreigners. Our true home is above where Christ is. Now, the root of this understanding for Christians as exiles and sojourners lies not in the story of Abraham or in the nation of Israel, as much as it does in the destiny of our Lord Jesus Christ. His mission and his rejection, which ultimately brought him to the cross. And similarly, our lives will eventually conflict with the world around us if we are faithful to him. So in 2020, 281 million people, that's 3.5% of the global population, migrated from their home country to a foreign nation. It's a lot of people. It's, it's amazing. And in their new countries, they face constant pressure to assimilate, to conform to dominant values and allegiances of the, of the society that they now found themselves in. And like these exiles, Peter is saying disciples of Jesus must maintain their distinctive communal identity, social cohesion, and commitment to group values, traditions, beliefs, and norms in the face of constant pressure to conform. You know, this is a particularly relevant message for the church today, where most Christians are, in some important ways, not very distinguishable from everyone else around them. We divorce at the same rate. We have the same addictions. We seek the same forms of entertainment. We wear the same fashions. We're filled with the same anxieties. And the reason for that is that we want the same thing that the world does for ourselves and for our children. And so it's not surprising that we're easily manipulated by the same media, which seeks to create fear and anger to generate large followings. How does anxiety have such a huge hold over us? You know, we all know anxiety can affect our emotional state and, and make interacting with the world more difficult. But it's what may be less obvious is how anxiety alters what we're actually conscious of and, and even the way that we experience reality. So the 19th century American psychologist, William James, described the human visual attention system by comparing it to a spotlight that scans the world around. And this attentional spotlight represents our focus at a given moment. That spotlight allows your mind to focus on what's important and to ignore whatever is irrelevant. And that makes reality comprehensible because we can't possibly comprehend everything in a single moment. You know, we have to choose what we're going to focus on at any given moment of time. And while most of our time, we can actually choose what to focus on. But it's not always voluntary. For example, if suddenly we perceive something that is dangerous, then all of a sudden, all of our emotions, everything goes into responding to that threat. And anxiety causes this threat detention, detection system to become hypersensitive, changing the behavior of our attentional spotlight in a way that does harm. Specifically, some control over the spotlight is lost as we're too easily grabbed attention by something that we perceive as, as threatening. Whether or not it's actually threatening or not, it's perceived that way because we, we're, we're looking at, at this way with such hypertension. And when one is only focused on a threat, negative information consumes our consciousness. Now, as the world has become more and more filled with anxiety, as it fills itself with negativity, Peter calls his readers in verse 6 and verse 8 to do the opposite. He urges us to rejoice. But how do we do that? Well, we must eliminate the sources of anxiety in our lives. And it begins with understanding that as disciples of Jesus, we do not belong to this world. 
We are sojourners. And therefore, we must not think like the world and we must not get sucked into its agendas. We need to be transformed in our thinking about who we are in Christ and what that implies about our relationship to one another and to society at large. Now, to move from anxiety to rejoicing requires not just re-examining our relationship with the world, but we must grasp all that we have in Christ. We are truly blessed, and we so often forget that. In verse 3, Peter declares, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Peter wants his readers to recognize the sweeping scope of new life in Christ and its implications for how they view themselves now that they've been born again by the mercy of God the Father. They are now a people of hope when previously they were not a people of hope. You know, one of the factors that differentiated the survivors of concentration camps during World War II were those who did not survive was the presence of hope. Holocaust survivor and psychologist Frankel Markle, reflecting on his experience of who did not survive, wrote this. He said, the prisoner who had lost his faith in the future, his future, was doomed. And with his loss of belief in the future, he also lost his spiritual health and hold. He let himself decline and become subject to mental and physical decay. And usually, this happened quite suddenly. He simply gave up. There he remained one day, lying in his own excrement, and nothing bothered him anymore. We humans simply cannot live without hope. We need hope to wake up every morning. And anxiety always robs us of hope. Hope changes the internal attentional spotlight away from negative things to the goodness of God, enabling us to be able to rejoice even amid suffering. This living hope is established in God's election of us. So in the very first line of this letter, Peter writes, to those who are elect exiles. And this word elect means to select or choose, generally by God uh, as the electing agent. And this description of God's people is rooted in the memory of God's election and covenant of the house of Jacob at Mount Sinai. You remember of all the nations of the earth, God chose the Israelites. And it was to them and them alone that he revealed himself to them. And similarly, Peter is saying that of all those who are in the world, everyone who is in Christ have been chosen to be his people as well. In verse 2, Peter writes that this selection was according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. And this foreknowledge denotes God's predetermining knowledge. Before we ever existed, he established our whole design. And in accord with this glorious design, we fulfill the work that he has chosen us to do. And that means none of us are an accident. It means that we are, we're part of God's plan. And this puts this things into perspective. It wasn't because of something we did that we were chosen. It wasn't that you know God looked back into the into the past, and he saw, oh, this is a good person. I'm going to choose this person. But God chose us to be a child from the foundation of the world, and he did so out of grace. It wasn't because you did something. It was because of his unmerited favor 
that we are where we are today. And that electing purpose of God made re was made real when we came to faith. But that faith itself was completely a gracious act of God's Holy Spirit. It was his spirit who first stirred inside our hearts to reaching out toward God, quickening our understanding of the gospel and convicting us to sin. Our election as the people of God is one of the chief reasons that we can confidently entrust our lives to our faithful creator, embrace hope, and truly rejoice today. Now this living hope, Peter goes on to say, is in an imperishable, undefiled, and unfading inheritance that awaits us in the heavenly realm. You know, Israel too was, had the promise of a, of a great inheritance as his chosen people. But that inheritance was defiled and lost as a result of idolatries, foreign invasions, and deportations. You remember how Esau traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. Esau didn't believe, and he didn't receive the promises, and neither did Israel. For disciples of Jesus, the perishable turf of the Israelites has been replaced with something transcendent, something permanent. It's an inheritance distinguished from the inheritance promised to the Israelites in four critical ways. First, the Christian focus of hope is not on the acquisition of land from its former landlords. Second, Christians are not defined as belonging to any land. Christianity is a worldwide phenomenon with a, with a global mission. Third, the notion of the Holy Land is superseded by a holy community. Christian brotherhood, wherever it exists, provides a place of identity and belonging for the reborn children of God. And fourth, the inheritance of Christians in contrast to the inheritance of the Holy Land, is one that cannot perish, be defiled, or fade. You know, that inheritance is going to be disclosed at the very end of time, when a, when a new earth and a, and a new uh, heaven are revealed to us. New Jerusalem will be there, and that's the place where we will dwell with with God and his son Jesus forever and ever. You know, over the years, I have seen brothers and sisters in Christ who have been schemed out of inheritances they had longed for. And often, this was, this was their siblings that were involved in doing this. The promise of inheritance preserved in heaven is meant to instill in us such a hope that we no longer need to pursue treasures on earth. We can truly rejoice because a great inheritance awaits us. So wonderful that we can't even fathom it right now. But it awaits those who are God's people. You know, the Lord never intended his people to live in anxiety. And so when we live in anxiety, we're living counter to the way that, that God intended us to live. And to be set free, our intentional spotlights must be on the things that are above, not on the worries of this earth. You know, in spite of the anxieties that our world endures today, Of all the times in human history, it's a supreme privilege to live at this moment in time because we follow the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter notes in verses 10 through 12 
that the sufferings and glories of Christ were the subject not only of the prophet's attention, but even the center of the angel's interest. It's like, it's like all of heaven had been waiting for this moment of time, and now you and I are a part of that. We are more privileged in the perspective of redemptive history than we could possibly know. More privileged than either the great prophets of old or the angels above. Fellow sojourners, whatever you're facing today, whatever anxieties, rejoice. Rejoice because you don't belong to this world. Rejoice because you've been born into a living hope that can never, ever be taken away. Let's pray.